Thank you, uh, thank you, Rabia, and thank you to the panelists. And um, before we before we move on, I wanted to share with you some of the interesting findings of the first poll. I'm just going to pull those up on my uh, on my phone right here. And uh, we had 123 people who voted in the poll, so that's great. Uh, the number one answer: about 50% of people felt that SPACs can become a long-term solution, but with improved regulation and structuring. The second option, 30% of the audience felt that SPACs will become a new path rivaling IPOs for going to public markets. The third was more skeptical of SPACs, that they're a temporary solution but overhyped and will diminish in uh, importance. And that was 13%. But there is also, interestingly, 7% of the audience that believes that they will, be, they will grow to eclipse IPOs as the dominant path towards uh, public markets. So uh, thank you for participating in that poll. And uh, just before we, we go on, there's, a, there's another poll that we'll be doing, and now about the trends in the sector. As we kick off this next panel, which is really about the trends that are taking place in uh, the tech and startup ecosystem. And as we saw in the reports earlier, we've seen a huge leap in the number of, of deals and value spent from uh, half a billion dollars in 2019 to over two billion in the, in the first three quarters. And some of the hottest sectors we've seen have been around fintech, logistics, SaaS, cloud kitchens. You'll find a lot of those in your poll. You can pick multiple choice for this one. So you can pick more than one sector that you're excited about investing in. And please lock in your votes. And I will be uh, uh, um, introducing our speakers. We will have with us Amir Farha, the founder of Kotu Ventures. Omar al Majdouri, the uh, founding partner at Ra'id Ventures. Riyad Abu Jaudi, partner at MEVP. And the moderator will be Huda Lawati, the CEO and founder of Alif Capital. Uh, Huda's career spans 16 years in strategy and investment management. Before establishing Alif, Huda was the chief investment officer at Savolla, uh, a, the, one of the largest food and retail groups in the MENA with a market cap of five and a half billion. And before that, she served as the CIO at Abraj, a member of their global uh, investment committee. Welcome, Huda, and welcome to the speakers on stage. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, MEVP, for hosting us. Uh, just small correction, it's not 16 years, it's 20 years, which uh, just dates me a bit more, but <laughs> that was probably a dated bio. Um, we've heard a lot about uh, the sector and the trends from Omar. We've heard about exits. But we thought, uh, for this panel, we're looking at the trends globally and how they are uh, relevant to or impact our region in particular. Um, we have three investors here who have been investing for a while in the region. And um, I'd like to start with just looking at what we have seen over the past year or two in terms of global trends and how we've seen their impact here. Uh, what's happened recently is venture has gone from Silicon Valley to global. Uh, exits have become, as we saw with the SPACs, uh, it's become not just paper money, but actual exits. Uh, we've seen a lot of um, unicorns. I think the last number I read was 900 globally. Um, how is all of that, what are the trends that you see within that, and how is that relevant to our region? So if we can start uh, with you, Riyadh. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Hada. Um, there are lots, one big trend we're seeing globally is the interest from international investors in, uh, in new markets, right? We're seeing, as Walid mentioned in the morning, and even Omar on the international investors investing and in looking at the region. So I think from a geographic point of view, there's a, this is a, there's a welcome change. So they're looking at the MENA region, they're looking at frontier geographies like Pakistan, Nigeria, uh, even Algeria, etc. So this is, this is pretty interesting. In terms of sectors, I think what's an, a global trend that is emerging and that is of interest to us, especially where I think the MENA region has the right to play and potentially have a global champion, is Web 3.0. We, we, we mentioned this morning the first slide on Web 3.0, um, about Web 3.0 on, on, on our MEVP event for a reason. We think that uh, 
this will be a game changer in, in general with the distribution of ownership of, or trust after read and read and write and now read and write and own, right, with art, games. Uh, there could be a global uh, champion rising from the MENA region, which really excites us. I think this is a global trend that will accelerate the pace of, adopt, of MENA rising out of, uh, a champion out of it. Uh, one of the leading Web 3.0 example is a game from Vietnam called Axie Infinity. And from Vietnam out of uh, all places and even in Southeast Asia, which didn't see a lot of VC activity before. So we're, we are very excited about what's coming globally and where the MENA region, especially around games, art, uh, uh, DeFi, etc., there is a play for, for, for us. How about you? What do you see, Amir? Hello? Yeah. So uh, thanks for having me, MEVP. Um, thanks for the, uh, for the question. I guess, um, look, for us, what we see um, happening is there's a, a lot of capital in the markets globally, not, a, not only in the region. I mean, uh, the past year and a half, has, we've seen such an influx on all levels. And so uh, competition is, is getting much more intense. Valuations are, are, are growing in, uh, at the Series A onwards, even at seed today. And these big platforms, whether it's a Tiger, Sequoias of this world, are, are, are looking at global opportunities. And so um, I think that brings with it some, some exciting things for regions like ours, but also some challenges where we have to really um, uh, compete uh, on these deals and be much faster at, at, at investing and stuff like that. So it's going to be interesting to see how, how um, the regional players develop and, and adjust to this, this sort of, uh, I wouldn't call it new normal, but this influx of capital that's coming to market. Um, when it comes to sectors, I think for me, I think we still have a lot to build when it comes to infrastructure. Uh, even for Web3, you think about crypto exchanges, you think about payment trails for a lot of the region that, that is quite fragmented. I think if we can create this you know, regional infrastructure, whether it's in logistics, payments, or other things, once that's fully developed, I think we're going to see a whole set of really exciting opportunities emerge. Um, I do think we're going to have more global uh, opportunities coming out of the region. Uh, for me, I think that's more opportunistic right now. Like a lot of interesting software companies are being built uh, out of uh, UAE and Egypt that could have uh, global aspirations. Um, so yeah, at the seed stage, I think for us, we just are trying to find the, really the high potential founders that are trying to change both regional and global uh, opportunities. Amar, moving on to you, but focusing now a bit more on Saudi particularly and what you have seen there, how things have developed. I think you started in 2016, but it's been a very, very fast pace since. So tell us about what you're seeing there specifically in terms of trends and growth. And specifically, there's a lot of um, sovereign money as well as private capital going into this space. And how is the split and is the growth sustainable? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, first, I want to uh, just uh, tell you that we changed our logo, so please update the logo. We spent some money there, so we want to, we want to show it now. Um, number two, let's, let's just uh, um, uh, talk about, about the MENA region and how it relates to, to the world. So if you, can, if you try to connect MENA region to US or to China or to India, it's, you can't. Those countries are homogeneous countries, big countries with big population. Um, it doesn't relate. Um, but what really makes more, what make more sense to us to think about is uh, Latin America. So Latin America is a uh, is more fragmented um, um, continent with population that is more or less around what we have in MENA region plus Turkey plus Pakistan, plus Iran, of course, because Iran is now excluded, but one day it will be included. And if you count all of these fragmentation and opportunity size, uh, you will see that uh, Latin America, th four or five years ago, uh, barely can have one or two unicorns. And now they have about 25 plus, and you can hear every week or two, a new unicorn is emerging in, in Latin America. Um, so definitely, those who missed the opportunity of investing in 2016, 17, 18 in Latin America are, are missing a lot, a big opportunity uh, in, that, in that continent. And this is exactly, this is what we can relate to, to the region, that um, this region now on the verge of or inflection point of, of really uh, exponential growth and, and uh, crazy adoption in technology, and uh, that comes with um, accumulated value of these uh, companies. And for example, 
from what I have uh, uh, seen or know uh, so far is uh, um, four or five companies in the, in the 2022 will raise at, 20, at unicorn uh, valuations in MENA region. And that is five only in one year. So imagine if you can just drag a bit the, the trend um, uh, line and you will see that in 2023 and 2024 how the, um, the trajectory will look, for, will look like. So it's definitely one of the best uh, times for, for MENA region when it comes to investment and when it comes to harvesting also. Uh, so that is what relates to MENA. Uh, in terms of Saudi, of course, it's part of the, of the region. So, uh, so the region in general is trying to create hubs, each country trying to attract um, uh, technology startups, attract uh, talents, attract a lot of things. Dubai did best uh, in that in the last 10 years. I think Saudi and Egypt is trying to do the same. And... Um, I can't, I can't say that, um, that Saudi w can compete Dubai because Dubai is, is investor friendly. Actually, they are based on the, their, their mindset is all about investments. So, it's, uh, so they are always trying to make sure that they are ahead of, 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 uh, of being friendly to investors uh, more than any, more competing with global hubs actually. So, but in general, Saudi Arabia has a depth and um, um, uh, uh, the wealth to really create a hub that is not necessarily similar to what you see here in Dubai, but more or less can be something that is substantial and impactful. And this is my opinion about how Saudi can, uh, can be in the next three years at least. And what about uh, uh, private versus sovereign funding into the sector in Saudi, in Saudi specifically? Yeah, actually all of this money that you have seen uh, is, is private and sovereign. Actually, maybe majority of them are sovereign, but in general, there is a big portion of it is FDIs, and uh, the FDI portion is getting uh, bigger with time. Uh, in our funds, now SoftBank just closed uh, a Uniphonic deal. Uh, uh, there is another deal will be announced very soon, uh, led by Sequoia India in Saudi Arabia. And there is another deal that we will announce maybe uh, December or January that will be led by a U.S. Uh, growth fund. So all of these funds are coming to Saudi after the value uh, is created and uh, we can expect more and more of these FDIs in the, in the near future in Saudi Arabia. Inshallah. Amir, you've been investing in VC for a while but you recently founded KOTU with a view to back the underdog. Um, talk to us a little bit more about the stages of funding in the region, how you see early stage, because we both hear that startups don't get enough capital and that there's too much capital in the VC space. What's the reality? Look, I, I, um, so I've been doing this yeah, I don't want, for a long time, uh, but I think when we started uh, way back in 2012, 11, even MVP I think was even earlier than us, so um, I think the region was, we were very optimistic. We started doing comp investments from seed all the way through to B because there was no capital. Uh, if you look at the trajectory of funding in the ecosystem if, in 2012, I think it was like something like $30 million in the whole MENA region. And this first half of 2021 is over a billion. So th that brings with it a lot of exciting things like specialization, stage focus, sector focus. Now you have enough opportunities to have, you know, um, let's say in some cases, fintech focused funds, given fintech is now one of the most popular um, sectors in the region right now when it comes to deal flow. And for, for me, I saw the opportunity to really build out um, uh, a seed practice that really uh, encourages um, the highest potential founders to to basically uh, figure out product market fit. But I think the reasons for that are a lot to do with Kareem, for example. You know, for me, the underlying thesis there is that Kareem employed 4,000 people from Morocco all the way to Pakistan, and these are high potential people. And that company has gone off, or the graduates of Kareem have gone off to start over 100 companies. And so the quality and quantity of deal flow is now compounding so fast that you know, um, as a seed VC, you're getting access to really high quality deals earlier. And I, I mean, some of us have all invested at seed, but I think for me, it's, it's a stage that I, I see, a, um, I decided to really focus a lot on, on, uh, on, on uh, building, but also creating value added activities that are catered to that specific stage. 
And uh, Riyadh, from a sector perspective, we've heard a lot of fintech, health tech, all of that, but you also talked about Web 3.0, and that's obviously a uh, you know, different kind of investment, different kind of expertise as well in terms of understanding those businesses, finding the talent. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit broadly about sectors and then specifically about sectors that uh, cater to this Web 3.0 trend? Um. Yeah, absolutely. So, in general, uh, we divide the region into two zones, okay? Uh, GCC and Egypt, Pakistan, because we see a similar kind of demographics, similar segments, similar sizes, similar problems, similar infrastructure uh, gaps, right? That uh, was mentioned before. And I think the trends in both markets overlap, but uh, there is a difference in what uh, this, the, the customer needs, right? So, when we look at Egypt, uh, we see a lot of access issues, right? Access to transportation with Kareem and Swivel and Halan, right? Access to financial services, access to banking, access to uh, insurance, right? Uh, similar in Pakistan and other markets. In, in, um, so we, we look at mass plays that are provide access across the board. So the theme is access, but obviously financial services or fintech, you can divide it into maybe 20 sub-sectors, right? So, for us, we're not specific on which sectors, as long as the, you are solving an access problem to the mass segment, not to uh, not offering, uh, you know, uh, five-minute deliveries in, in in Cairo. For us, it's the 50 million neglected uh, Egyptians that lack access to uh, in, to, to to certain uh, life-improving uh, needs, right? In the GCC, it's more about efficiency, right? Uh, you know, uh, getting food faster, uh, getting better experience in, in, in retail, uh, getting a better experience in groceries, um, uh, buying, comparing insurance, or uh, uh, looking at, uh, uh, you know, uh, business to business. So we, we've done a, a, quite a few SaaS, B2B SaaS, so uh, how to improve uh, uh, productivity in business. So this is the general uh, trends that we see. In Web 3.0 specifically, honestly, we're still experimenting. Uh, we want to do a couple of um, seed investments to, uh, to test the water, but we're very uh, curious of, uh, right now because we're seeing, uh, we saw the launch of two actually NFT marketplaces already in the MENA region, and I think it's only the beginning. As people understand more uh, and the infrastructure layers are built, globally, uh, there could be an emerging uh, champion. It's maybe at least two years down the road, but in, in sub-sectors, um, in uh, Web 3.0, I think it's early to, to say, but definitely uh, decentralized finance, or what's called DeFi, uh, uh, gaming, right, play to earn, uh, uh, and, and others. NFT uh, marketplaces, so art. And just carrying that theme of, uh, uh, you know, finding these ideas, maybe Omar, to you in terms of the um, innovation that we see. We know there's a lot of growth in valuation and funding. We know there's a growth in the number of startups. Do you see that matched with the level of innovation, specifically sort of the more sort of deep tech or things that are going away more and more from consumer tech? Or do you feel the growth is still a lot on either the consumer tech or the valuation itself? Yeah, good question. Uh, thank you, Huda. Um, so no, I think uh, I think until now we we see that there is no relation actually between the valuation and the level of innovation. I think we see that um, the valuation is, ref is a reflection of two things: um, is the market opportunity size and the quality of founders. And this is what we see at the early stage. Now um, things will change, or let's say usually change uh, when when the uh, stage getting more and more mature. So, but at the moment, if you, if for example, someone uh, made an exit uh, a year ago and tried to do a new company, I think the valuation will always strike up like um, like crazy because we don't have enough of those guys who made an exits before, and 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 the amount of money that waiting for those guys is is massive. So definitely, those guys will be much more uh, expensive, regardless of the quality of idea or the quality of, of, uh, of model that they are having. Uh, so this is one of the problems that actually we are facing now in terms of uh, those who are experienced with track record trying to do something and the valuations at, at the pre-seed has become like uh, crazy. Um, number two is the quality of ideas and the quality of models. Actually, we are nascent market, so we, we shouldn't really even be, be, be hard on, on ourselves. 
So what, one thing that, for example, uh, we can see in China and India particularly, and Latin America, is that they started with imitation. They started with, with ideas that are available or that are um, uh, available in, in Europe and US. And now you can see that they are started to um, innovate new models and the new uh, and better quality uh, companies and deeper also tech. Uh, and this is happening, uh, this is actually something that we are now sensing, especially in Saudi Arabia, and maybe, maybe also somehow in Egypt and, uh, and UAE. But for example, now we are closing two companies in Saudi Arabia in AI, and one of them is in deep AI, in deep tech, um, solving big problem like Arabic NLP, NLU. And, and this is something that is, if, if those guys try, th thought of, of raising um, three or four years ago, maybe they will not really have enough money or they will have the, right, the wrong investors. Versus now, they, there is plenty of, uh, of, of interest in these type of, of uh, companies and technologies. And that is the normal and organic maturity of the ecosystem. Um, so we should really, act so actually the first thing that we, can, we should do to make sure that more and more of these quality companies are, are out there is by trying to invest and syndicate with the right people because yes, Raid is very good and value add investor and known for value add, but we are not uh, perfect. We need other investors to support the company from other aspects. And this is the lovely thing of, of VC um, uh, syndication. So early stage, Companies needs needs variety of, of, uh, of value add, and the smart investor will always think of picking uh, his or her um, syndicates by trying to complement the value add to this company that's relevant to that to that specific company. And for AI, we are trying to pick the right people when it comes to those who have experience in AI, experience in deep tech, experience in in, um, in uh, machine learning, and trying to attract them to the, to the company. So, so um, when it comes to quality, I think the quality is getting much better than before. I, I started investing in Saudi Arabia back in 2015, and barely I could find Morni, which is one company uh, back then. Uh, now we are, um, we are facing a flood of, of pipeline of really great companies, and we are passing great companies because of the limitation of resources. And, uh, and that is something that is uh, very unique um, uh, when it comes to, to, to this stage of the, of the ecosystem. It's just five years and still you can see a much faster pace to maturity um, in Saudi Arabia and in the region particularly, uh, in, in general. Yeah. I mean, from your perspective, talent and innovation, how do you see them, especially since you're looking at the early stage? Yeah, I echo Omar's uh, comments. I think, um, look, two things, I think there is Dubai puts itself in an interesting position where it can attract talent from global markets. We've seen one of our companies uh, build a bridge between Brazil and UAE, where, like Omar mentioned earlier, Brazil is the home of like over 20 unicorns. And so when you find talent that have gone and scaled those kind of uh, companies and you bring them to Dubai, they're going to bring all that knowledge and insight and network uh, with them. So. What started off as him hiring one head of growth is now 18 Brazilians are in his company, right? And that, th we're seeing more of those. Same thing with India. There is a bridge now as well. So as, we, as Dubai builds bridges, I think it gives access to this sort of global talent pool. I think Saudi and Egypt are very local markets. So the Saudi um, entrepreneur has hopefully, in, in some cases, has to be part of either as somewhat of a scale up and now um, Saudi has quite a few exciting companies that have gone on to be quite significant in size so we're hopefully going to see them recycle back new founders in their ecosystem. I think Egypt the same thing. Um, you know we have uh, in my past life we invested in uh, Swivel and Swivel's you know now unicorn um, and has you know gone off to start two other companies the co-founders have gone off to start Capitor and Telda and and that type of recycling is what we're really excited to see because it's compounding much faster than ever. I think, you know, Omar said in five years, but that's what compounding is. I think we're, you, you, no fund is going to be able to capture a fraction of what opportunities are going to come out. And each country is going to have its own set of, you know, significant uh, outcomes, right? So it's just about, you know, building the right relationships, syndicating, creating this sort of collaborative network that uh, lifts everybody up. So. 
Now, just looking, because you guys have a broad lens and you see multiple sectors and multiple startups, what are the sort of key challenges? And maybe if I split it by market and ask you to cover UAE, I don't know if it's regulation or if it's people, but um, ask you to cover UAE and then, Omar, um, if you can cover uh, Saudi and with Egypt. Yeah, that works. <laughs> Uh, challenges in uh, in scaling a startup in the UAE. Yeah. So, what do startups and founders find the most difficult? Where do you find like you could, you would like to see something change? Yeah. In certain sectors in the UAE, regulation is um, is not super supportive. So, in for example, in banking um, and and others, it's it's difficult. The regulators in some regulators are really strong in certain sectors, and um, they are still not adopting new. Uh, uh, you know, uh, frameworks and sandboxes and innovating in certain sectors. I think this is the biggest challenge here. Uh, obviously, Dubai is a great, and the UAE is a great place to attract talent from abroad, to establish business, et cetera, business, etc. Uh, so I think the, the key challenge, I would say, is um, in certain sectors, the regulation. But uh, we're seeing changes every day, so uh, I think most will catch up in terms of uh, adopting new laws and new regulations that, are, uh, that open up uh, better experiences for the customers, faster business transactions, easier business-to-business uh, you know, uh, uh, -business, uh, interactions. So we are hopeful. Omar, Saudi. Hello. Regarding Saudi, I'm sure that um, maybe those who are in the ecosystem heard about the tax authority and impact on on some of the tech uh, companies like Fetcher, Uber, Kareem, and this, uh, these things. Um, I see it from my side as normal dispute, but it's uh, been magnified somehow. But uh, in general, it's normal. Uh, there are some problems in tax authority. They are very new authority. Actually, they are just uh, uh, three years old, I think, or four years old, and they are trying to learn. And there is a flood of of disputes now in front of them, so so um, so we can give them some, let's say, excuse of, of why they are a bit late in rectifying things. Uh, but in general, um, uh, despite that, other th other than that, I think uh, attracting talents to Saudi is is difficult. It's not really a, a, as easy as Dubai. It's getting improved now. So uh, so in general, now you can attract more. And more. I see more and more um, uh, Europeans and U.S. citizens are based in Saudi, trying to do business. It's not as easy as here, definitely, but it's getting much more improved than before, and you can predict the future by seeing the pace. Um, still, Saudi Arabia is a country that you can't really uh, deal with it remotely. It's not easy to deal with it remotely. Uh, so being present in Saudi Arabia is super important uh, to really become, um, to take the, the value of this, of this country. So this is, what, this is our advice to our founders, is that try to allocate enough time for yourself as founders, uh, or even relocate as partially if you can, to, to make sure that you can really get the, uh, the, the beauty of this, of this market. And the market is very beautiful when it comes to, to, um, to feasibility. It's, it's a very lucrative market. And one example, I'm sure that maybe it's always known that, that food aggregators are losing uh, money. We can see it in the public markets, we can see it everywhere, except of Saudi. Now, I know three of them, Hungry Station, Jahiz, Mersul, and we are, part, we are uh, investors in Mersul, and all of the three are scaling fast and, and having tons of money of, of profit uh, every month. Actually, one of them, I can't uh, mention uh, the name, uh, are actually having about 40 million reals per month in, in, uh, in surplus uh, cash and about less than that by little in, in net profit. It's massive and lucrative market and keep growing. And uh, now there is about 600 to 700,000 uh, orders per day. And you, and you can just imagine how, ma how many orders you can accumulate in this market. So it's very attractive. Despite all of these challenges, I think it's a no-brainer for, for founders and for entrepreneurs to think about Saudi to expand. Um, but when it comes to expansion, maybe it's good also to think about to whom uh, you partner with. So it's maybe important for, for founders to make sure that they hire the right people on the ground because it's not easy job and also partner with the right investors uh, there. 
And um, this is my take in Saudi. In Egypt, I think Amir maybe has some insight. Yeah, if we can get a, a couple of lines because Omar is giving me bad signs. Yeah, look, so. I, I won't talk about Egypt. Maybe I'll talk about two things. I think regulation, it's across the board, right? Yeah. UAE, Saudi, and Egypt, the regulators are all trying to adjust to this technology wave that's so fast that they can't keep up because governments are generally very slow. Um, so that's one of the bottlenecks. The other one is growth capital. I think we have now funding up to a certain point and then the rest is left up to the soft banks, uh, which is great, but at the same time, that's only a couple of options for these fast growing companies. So if we can figure out how to uh, provide multiple options on the growth side and build that stage, I think we have really exciting things to happen for our companies. Yeah. Thank you. So I think this, in summary, yes, there's been a lot of growth, but there's a lot more to come. I think the markets are attractive. Our price points in particular tend to be attractive combined with our labor costs. And uh, we need more funding at later stages. <laughs> Is that fair? <laughs> Great. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks for going over. Oh, sorry for going over time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Huda. Thank you for uh, the panelists. And don't shoot the messenger. But um, um, we are going to break for a small uh, uh, coffee break. I just wanted to, before I let you go, share with you some of the findings of our last poll. But about 70 people answering the poll. Uh, by far the number one uh, topic of interest for everyone was, I mean, you probably guessed it, fintech, with 73% of people saying they're interested in that, 48% uh, interested in health tech actually is higher than the numbers that we've seen. So an interesting space to watch. Uh, the next number was SaaS at 45%, logistics and transport 44%, EdTech 42%. That's another one that didn't show up as highly in our numbers. And so, uh, and then uh, a, a smattering of other uh, sectors. Those are the top ones. Uh, please, we're gonna be back here in 20 minutes. Please enjoy the coffee break and join us for our next session on FinTech Trends in MENA. Thank you so much.